Welcome everyone. We're glad you're here as we delve into our latest addition to our webinar series, the topic of recovery and how establishing a command center will enable organizations to navigate the complex road ahead to our new normal. I'd like to make a brief introduction. Our speaker today is Pete O'Dell, and he is a co-founder of Swan Island Networks and has been our CEO since 2015 and has worked in the technology, security, and software space throughout his career. Before joining Swan Island, Pete served as the chief operating officer for several high growth startups and was president of Autodesk Retail Products. He's also authored several books, including Silver Bullets, a book on interoperable data, and Cyber 24 seven, Risks Leadership Sharing. Also his new book, Global Shared Resilience, is slated for publication in Q4 of this year. So please type your questions during our presentation into the chat window on the right side of the screen, and we'll do our best to answer them in the Q&A period at the end of the session. Great, thanks Miranda. Uh, welcome everyone, it's Pete O'Dell. Um, I'm gonna be your uh, presenter today. And now we're going to jump right in and talk about enabling your economic recovery command center uh, with the subtext of using TX360, although I'm going to try to give you a lot of non-TX360 information around this. Um, so, so with that, uh, we'll give you a quick agenda. Uh, we're going to give an overview of some of the recovery challenges that are coming up. Uh, we're going to talk about why establish a command center and, and what that command center should look like or how what different designs that it can look like and types of considerations that you might need in establishing a command center. And then we'll spend some time talking about how TX360, our uh, situational awareness cloud platform, could help you uh, in two instances. One is a, a free information sharing exchange that we are sponsoring and rolling out over the next couple of weeks and also as our uh, command center software as a service offering, which can be deployed quickly and uh, put to work right away. And then we'll have time for uh, questions and answers. So I wanna take a minute and talk about resilience. Um, you're gonna see a lot about this over the next, uh, the next several years as the, as the uh, impact of the, uh, the pandemic and the recovery and other major, major issues like the, uh, the civil unrest that we're going through right now with the uh, George, George Floyd riots. Um, and other things that may come out of the recovery as well. Uh, that resilience is a, is a key issue that companies need to build into their state of being so that when disruptions happen, the, uh, the organization can absorb that blow and come out stronger. And you know, there's a formal definition on the left from Judith Roden who did a lot of work and wrote a great book uh, called The Resilience Dividend. She was the chairperson of, uh, of the Rockefeller Foundation. And then Timex summed it up really well in the 60s and did a whole set of, uh, of uh, commercials around the idea of, of taking a licking and keep on ticking, which is the essence of, uh, of that. So I wanna talk a little bit about proactive monitoring and continual situational awareness and, and, and focus for a minute on the other side because some of the tools that you probably have in your, in your corporation uh, are these break glass in case of emergency tools. And, and, and while they can be very, very good tools, uh, but one of the problems is, is if they if you go months or, or in some cases even years before you activate them, can be very easy to, uh, to forget the training that you had, very easy to not remember the passwords. Uh, there was actually a large scale delay in, the, uh, in, the, in, in calling back that, that, that horrific alert that they put about you know, nuclear weapons inbound to Honolulu uh, a couple of years ago because the governor couldn't remember his password to his, uh, to his account. And, and the information inside the, um, the system may be stale and, and which gives you a cold start and suddenly you have to ramp that system up. So uh, I wanna cover the idea of, of continually monitoring continually keeping an eye on the horizon, making sure that you know, uh, you know what's coming at your organization. And that is you know, being, being active on a 24 seven basis. And that can be you know, people or automated model, you know, having content subscriptions that can bring you alerts of what's going on around the world, uh, being able to, to buy yourself time on these emerging threats. And, and with the idea that time gives you uh, the ability to prevent in some cases, or at least mitigate um, 
problems. And you, you saw that with COVID, right? There's a lot of studies that said if we had implemented a shelter in place policy a week or two earlier than we did, the number of deaths throughout the, the COVID pandemic may have been much smaller in the United States. Another advantage of proactive monitoring and continual situational awareness is you're ready to go on a no-notice emergency. I mean, some emergencies just show up and you get no warning and suddenly they're in progress. Having a, a, a capability that keeps you going will give you the ability to quickly grab uh, information. You've got to identify viable resources. If you get into a situation where you have to add more, those resources can be added to both internally and externally. And it gives you a, a tool that you're used to using on a day in and day out basis. And that can be optimized to your business. And, uh, and from, a, from, a, from a cost standpoint, it pays for itself. If you look at the average organization uh, who's using Google Chrome and not coordinating in the kind of information that you need uh, on a day in and day out basis to manage stretch, you'll find that there's a hidden cost that's maybe 10 or 15 times larger than a program to actually have intelligence gathered, aggregated, and communicated out through the, uh, through the organization. So something to look at as new budgets come into play in 2021, what we're seeing from many of our customers is budgets are gonna be very tight because we're looking at being in a, um, in a global recession. And, uh, and so from a, from a sit rep standpoint, situational report right now, um, in case you haven't noticed, there's a pandemic going on. You know, there's other threats that are happening right now, you know, severe weather, um, you know, rioting, supply chain disruptions, and this is a global problem. And, we, and in this global problem, we've never really stopped the entire planet at once before, right? The essential services continue to go, power and, you know, power and water and those types of things, but the discretionary piece of the world, the economy, is just stopped and, and the reopening is going to be very uh, difficult. And it's happening by every organization, every piece of government, every nonprofit, everybody's got a chart that, uh, that reopening strategy. So I wanted to give you a few thoughts for your recovery plan thinking. Uh, complexity is, is emerging as a big problem. And the complexity is, you know, the, everything's different. The world is upside down. And so different parts of your company that you used to understand how this group interacted with this group, how this data affected this over here, how these customers would make these support requests, all that is upside down. You know, a simple example is, is, is Clorox. Clorox, you know, had, had a, a multi, multi-year history of being able to keep this, the you know, shelf stocked with their uh, disinfecting wipes. And suddenly, um, because of the, uh, the pandemic and, and, the, and the scare that was amplified for the pandemic, they were, they were wiped out. They, they literally sold everything they had in every, every store in America. And uh, it took, it's taking them, they're still trying to catch up by working 24 hours a day. So that kind of complexity where things are moving around becomes important. And then also, you know, government is trying to adjust to making this new normal. So there are new laws showing up and those laws are gonna change as, as we go forward. So a state may open up and they go to this phase one, phase two that you've heard about, but at phase two, if they open up too, too aggressively and the virus starts showing up and causing major, uh, major issues, they may have to go back to phase one. And so suddenly keeping track of that from your organizational standpoint is gonna be very important. And, if, and, if, and you know, you're gonna need to keep, keep do that. And, and one way to do that is to share information. We'll certainly touch on that a little bit. But the other method is, is having a command center. Um, and call that a crisis command center, a security operations center, a global security operations center, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we, you know, we're going to talk about this function, which can be in person or virtual or distributed. I mean, you can do it in a number of different ways. But the key is a, a group of people that are focused on taking care of your organization's recovering strategy and be able to work across the entire company. You know, so every every different um, you know silo or department, cylinder of excellence across the uh, across the company, can be be worked on and, and be organized by this command center approach. And that command center is guided by the C-suite and the board of directors to ensure that the strategic directives that the company needs to think about in terms of how much cash, how much, how much inventory should we build, when, when are our customers coming back, 
you know, what's the amount of risk you want to take, that all those strategic directions are actually translated in the tactical tasks and outcomes as you start driving through your, uh, your recovery. The, the command center approach is also going to drive a lot of time savings because suddenly you're avoiding some redundancies, you're able to deconflict some of the uh, some of the different issues that might come up where one department's doing it one way, one department's doing it another way, or one region is, is, is in conflict with another region or a country office is separate from another country office. And it gives you a single point of accountability. Uh, the other good news though is, you know, th this whole model is reusable for future crises. And the future crisis may not be a pandemic. Uh, there, you know, there's a list of about 10 or 12, you know, major, major global affecting uh, emergencies that could happen. And uh, the same kind of uh, command center mentality and, and operational capability will be something that will be uh, helping you become more resilient as an organization. And, and there are a lot of different organizations out there. So our, our customers span, you know, um, you know, small to medium business, all the way up to some gigantic multinationals. And if, if you're a multinational, you may have to have multiple command centers, right? You may have an entire uh, European division where they need to have a command center, but it needs to be in, in, uh, in concert with the one at headquarters, which may be in the United States, at least in our case. Um, and, uh, and you have to be, be careful that, you know, things that you're doing where you're suddenly scheduling a conference call if you're in New York, you know, you know, for, for noon, may suddenly have somebody at 2 a.m. in the morning in Mumbai trying to attend, you know, not the greatest way to share information. Maybe you better to do time shifted information through, you know, written written uh, information, alerts, those types of things. And then, and then clearly there are also specifics to your organization. You know, what industry sector are you in? How, how do your customers uh, interact with you, right? Do they show up in your restaurants so that you're face-to-face -face and, you, and, you know, you've got that model? Are you a, a uh, providing them information distantly? In our case, as Swan Island Networks, most of our customers, you know, we, we in many cases, we've never seen them, but we may talk to them every day, right? What are your supply chain issues? Are you getting, are you getting uh, materials from someplace around the world who may be having an entirely different experience with reopening? And is that going to impact you? And you have to go to a secondary and tertiary sourcing for some of your critical materials to enable your reopening. So that's important, as well as, you know, you know, you know, what are your task breakdowns, right? The, the reopening and the recovery is gonna be very different if you're a work at home company, you can just go, well, you know, when it's good, we'll come back to work. Whereas if you're a meat processing plant and suddenly everybody shoulder to shoulder processing, you know, the, uh, the food running through the plant as critical as a part of the supply chain, you're gonna have a very different reopening uh, process because suddenly you've got to go back to 100%. You can't go 20%, 40%, 60%, oh wait, let's hold at 60 and then later to 100%. And you gotta look at how are you being regulated? Who's out there paying attention to your business? You know, do you have to worry about inspections? Do you have to worry about laws? You know, is there certain reporting that you have to do? All those types of uh, things. So that's a quick overview of the recovery. You know, I wanted to talk about, you know, the uh, who should be the leader in the command center. And, and I wanted to stress leader versus manager. Uh, this is a leadership position. It's going to be important to be able to take command, but do it in a way that that works for the organization and can get the job done, you know, working from the C-suite down to every level of employee throughout the, uh, the, out the organization. And that's a tough job, right? And, and Superman's probably not available. Um, you know, this person needs to have an understanding of all the business functions, different, you know, the ability to innovate because things might have to be done differently. And they're gonna have to be flexible to new approaches and working those approaches with other parts of the organization who may be resistant and, and, and trying to make quick decisions uh, when it's called for and uh, against a set of trade-offs that may be, may be very difficult, right? If there's suddenly a, a bias recurrence in the Midwest at, at, at six of a company's um, facilities, you know, what, what are you gonna do to make that trade-off to you know, do you shift, in for, shift work to the people in New York and California? Do you shut that group down? You know, how do you respond? And, and so that communication role has to go across the entire set of, uh, of people inside the organization. But in many cases, the, uh, the command center head, who might also be called the chief recovery officer, 
um, or the, the, the head of the command center may be working for the chief recovery officer, depending on how companies stru structure it. Those, those, um, those people may have to also talk to external entities, right? You know, regulators, NGOs, state, local, federal government, all in, uh, all in different uh, levels of uh, communication. So important to think this through as to who's really going to be the best, uh, the best leader for your command center effort. And then what are the functions of that command center in terms of, you know, what are they going to do on a, on a either a 24 by 7 basis or, you know, maybe it, maybe it only takes 12 hours a day. Um, my guess is that's probably the minimum that any corporation is going to be able to, uh, to go to. It's going to be a big, uh, a big job. So situational awareness is key. And we'll talk more about that in the, uh, the second half of the webinar. Being able to set objectives and measuring whether those objectives were were, were achieved and how to uh, how to make those make the trade offs and decisions around those and then also analyzing the mass of information both from inside the organization but also from the uh, from the outside because this is going to be a highly volatile um, environment and as I mentioned there, there's going to be conflict between different parts of the organization it's almost inevitable when you change all the rules or suddenly all the rules evaporate that as people reestablish the new normal that there's going to be conflict and and so the uh, the command center is going to have to help deconflict those uh, those problems and a key to, to to working through all those issues is having a very good you know status and communications capability that covers the entire uh, the organization and can go outside and that gives people different information, right? The, the CEO may need different information than the VP of operations in Cleveland. Um, so managing the, uh, the information flow to the different groups is going to be very, uh, very important. And then when you, when you establish your command center, one of the things you have to worry about is what happens if we have a, uh, a virus recurrence in the command center, right? Do you have redundant personnel? Or if, you, if you're doing a physical command center, do you have a redundant facility? What if that building gets shut down and you, you put all kinds of equipment and communications capability in there and suddenly, um, you know, there's an outbreak and you have to relocate it to another part of the organization in another state. So things to think through as you're building a command center strategy and a recovery strategy. Also, you know, while, while you have a command center, um, again, if it's a physically manifested, you can do a distributed one and people are going to be, you know, further away. But, you know, a lot of companies prefer having everybody in a, uh, in a room. So the social distancing is going to come into play, screening uh, people for symptoms, making sure that the uh, at shift change, if you're running 24 seven, that the, um, that you're getting sanit sanit sanitizing, uh, cleaning in, and monitoring the traffic in and out as to, you know, we're bringing too many people in, too many people out and putting people at risk. And then other things to think about is the privacy issues, right? As you're thinking about monitoring your employees coming back to work, you know, there, there's certain risks that you have to take by collecting health data. There are certain controls you have to put into place. Contact tracing is another set of, of rules and conventions that has not really been you know, taken and had best practices applied. It's going to be very different by uh, by industry, and it's going to be very different by state because nobody really knows um, if if the state is going to come back to the employee and say, "Oh, you know, you've been exposed by somebody that we just talked to a few minutes ago who tested positive with COVID, and now we're calling you." Uh, it's very unclear in most states whether they're also going to call the employer if they know that. And what happens if three of the people that were exposed to each other all work for the same company? What's that loop going to be between the, the government, the, the uh, employing company, and all the employees, and maybe contractors and visitors at the same time, right? Since most companies, you know, if they've got a facility, not only the employees, but they've also got contractors that are servicing those employees. They've got visitors showing up. And it gets even more complicated in a multi-tenant building where you suddenly got 30 different companies, you know, spread out across 75 floors of a high rise. You know, what do you do there from, uh, from all these different uh, issues? So very, uh, very complicated. And because it's complicated, one of the key issues is working together with other companies to try to share information about best practices, about changing conditions, 
And to that end, uh, we we're actually sponsoring an information sharing environment called RISE, the Recovery Information Sharing Exchange, uh, that is built on our TX360 technology. Uh, we're gonna allow two logins per, per company. And this is an environment that's not a website. It, it's a secure environment, everybody's vetted, no bots, no trolls. Um, you know, no just random people, you know, showing up and participating. So it's a, it's a known environment where you can share, uh, but it's not designed to share proprietary information. In fact, we recommend companies don't share proprietary information, but there's plenty of information both on, a, uh, on an industry basis. So if everybody's in the pharmaceutical industry, that they can share information about best practices to get their industry recovered and back on the road to success. But also we've got the issue of, of, of regional sharing. So if you're in a high rise in downtown uh, Boston and, and there are 40 high rises around you with, with another you know, 5,000 companies, you've all got the same issues on public transportation. You've all got the same issues on employees coming into the building and likely going through some kind of health screening. You've all got the issue of the elevators being a choke point where you don't want to get more than four people on the elevator. There's a whole series of things where we're trying to get a, uh, a best practice in place that can also be coordinated with your local government becomes really important, saves a ton of time. And that's where the idea of information sharing becomes very, uh, very important. So we're gonna seed RISE with information about the recovery, but we're also gonna be working to take submissions from participants in the, um, in the RISE network to drive this information sharing spiral where everybody's sharing information and saying, oh, here's what I saw, or here's what I just heard, here's a new alert that you may have, uh, you may have missed. And we think that's gonna be very powerful across a wide range of, uh, of topics. So this is an, an initial step that we're working on, you know, things like testing, um, resurgence of the virus, both globally and, and across the US, you know, state regulations, testing, corporate travel, all the type of things that, that may impact uh, your organization, both as you're planning to reopen and then as you're in the process of, of reopening. So all very, um, very important to, uh, to monitor. And this is an example of, for example, a, a business and economy dashboard showing, you know, what's the state of the market today? What's the, uh, you know, what's the information on, on uh, you know, the uh, stock market news, uh, different related strategies. And as you can see, this information is coming in from a variety of, uh, of sources. So it can give you a tremendous way of focusing on what's the important uh, information. So that's that's the first part. I just that's the you know what do you do about recovery? I wanted to share um, about what TX360 can do for you from a recovery standpoint, and and I'll talk a little bit about from a general standpoint as you're out looking at technology, and and you know I'd encourage you to look at tools that are going to allow you to save time and maximize your smart people's capabilities. And so these are some of the key issues as you look at different technologies. Uh, one in particular is that break glass or continuous use. Uh, but you know, how fast can you deploy the technology? If, if it's a six month deploy and it's gonna cost you $3 million and it's gonna take you three months to write the, the RFP, you know, it's probably not gonna help you uh, with, with reopening your company. So the speed of deployment is very important. The ability to use it very quickly, you know, pick it up. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, became Zoom experts immediately having never used the product before. That kind of being able to pick up a product and use it becomes very important. You know, making sure the technology is available for home use and requiring maybe only a browser and a, uh, you know, a login to the cloud and being able to customize it to your own, uh, your own organization, uh, both from the standpoint of information of where your geospatial assets are around the world and being able to drive um, have a base of knowledge included that gets you started. So you're not sitting there trying to populate something that's empty, right? It's like, oh, it's right, so it's an empty Word doc. Let me type everything in here now, except I don't have time to figure all that out. So having a lot of startup information can become very important. Uh, the other keys are distributed use, being able to integrate with the other tools that you're using throughout your uh, throughout your command center. That may be incident management, that may be mass notification. And then being able to add surge resources. And surge resources is this idea that, and they have five people trained to do this on a day in and day out basis, but when something happens, I suddenly need 10. 
So where those five come from? Do they come from inside my company or are they available from one of my you know, vendors? So for example, we work with Allied Universal. They have a group of people they can provide uh, as an analyst, as a service, and, uh, and provide a surge resource in a command center for a, um, you know, for a company that needs additional people. And, uh, and the other key is, is a flexible contract without lock-in and then OPEX pricing, which makes contracting much, much, much easier. So that's a key, those are kind of high level things to think about no matter what kind of technology you're looking at. And, uh, and now I'll give you a quick overview of TX360, which as I mentioned, is a situational awareness product uh, threat monitoring, proactive intelligence, and can also be used for information sharing. It, it's set up as, uh, as being very easy to use, very rapid to deploy. And as I go from left to right, uh, I'll talk through each of these things in turn, uh, both the intelligence channels, asset monitoring, smart alerts, and the, uh, the dashboards. So the, when I talked about having a startup set of information to start your planning with, TX360 is actually key around that. We have over 2,000 global channels and are adding new channels all the time. Our customers can also add their own, both from external, things that, that, that we didn't know about, but they do, uh, but also internal information can be aggregated into you know, our, uh, our intelligence channels. So they're then available to be you know, filtered, displayed, aggregated with other information from the outside, and you end up with a very smooth way of, of automating the amount of information that you need to, uh, to look at. Another key element of that is knowing where your assets are around the world. And this, this is a US view, but, uh, but you know, our, our, our capability applies globally as do all of our information feeds. You can actually translate foreign language feeds with Google Chrome you know, instantly. Um, and so the geospatial capability gives you the ability to import your corporate assets or your organizational assets if you're not a corporation and, uh, and then be able to see where are those alerts relative to your different uh, facilities. So if, if, you, if you're in a large state like uh, Montana and there's something like, oh, big outbreak in Montana, uh, it's something like, well, our facility is in, uh, in Bozeman and the, the outbreak is in Helena. So, you know, it's far away, probably not a concern, but we now have that geospatial uh, uh, reference. And that geo, those, those different uh, intelligence pieces can be delivered in two different ways. So one is, you know, for people in the field or for people using, you know, email and text, uh, they can show up and become a, a rich alert. And I'll show you several examples of those. Uh, they can also integrate into different mobile apps if you have one. And uh, or be used in a mass notification capability as a way to go even broader than the, uh, the people we would uh, we would address. And so these are some different examples of what these uh, what these smart alerts look like. So you know you can see the original story that it came from, you know information about that alert, uh, an actual map with a location, um, and then these are some other ones on on virus uh, reoccurrence. And then uh, also some testing and reopening alert examples. And this will all be available on YouTube if you decide you want to go back and relook at uh, some of these capabilities. Uh, this is an example of proximity alerting. So, in the, and you can see in both of these alerts, um, if you look at the 32.7 uh, annotation, what that's saying is the nearby asset is 32 miles away from the earthquake. And so you can take and, and estimate, you know, what's the impact. Similarly, on the one on the right in Wisconsin, the particular asset that was in Wisconsin is seven miles away from where the alert was uh, was issued from. So it gives you a good idea of contextually, and when we have large-scale dashboards, you know, like this one of London, that gives you the ability to see contextually where did that alert happen relative to your facilities. And, and in this case, you have what's called a London Common Operating Picture, it's bringing in, you know, you know, probably 15 or 20 different sources of information and blending them into the single pane of glass for uh, for London. And these type these dashboards can actually be put together by an intelligence analyst in your company or by one of our intelligence analysts in a very short period of time. So you may never have had a problem in uh, in Seattle, Washington, and have no have no no, no real intelligence reference, but suddenly you find out your major supplier is having a, uh, a huge problem in downtown Seattle for some reason, you could actually build a dashboard and monitor that situation on an ongoing basis and be able to deliver that information 
to multiple people across the company, from the operations group that's dealing with the supply shortage, all the way up to the CEO and the board of directors, we're monitoring that from a, uh, from a strategic standpoint. These are a couple of examples of different, uh, different dashboards. And this is one we have a full set of, uh, of uh, COVID dashboards that we'd be happy to, uh, to share with you if you send us an email and have been available over the, uh, the whole time during the uh, pandemic. Uh, and then there's a couple of other ones from, from RISE about contact tracing and, um, and state regulations. So you can see, you know, in this case, you know, where is the, the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Services? And you can see from maps, different states taking different approaches with some of the different uh, alliances between, uh, between them. And then this is an example uh, of kind of an overlapping threat. You may be in the middle of your recovery, you may, you may be dealing with uh, virus outbreaks, but at the same time, you can't forget about severe weather, you can't forget about uh, flooding, you can't forget about earthquakes. It's, it's still gonna be a multi-threat environment, cyber attacks. So all those different things can be still affecting you. So you can actually build those types of dashboards um, into, your, into your command center and be monitoring multiple things. And then to, then to wrap up, just as a quick overview, uh, these are some things that as you think about both, both this recovery and then other emergencies you're gonna face over the coming years, there's several technologies that are gaining speed very quickly um, that will likely impact your, uh, your strategy going forward. So artificial intelligence is being built into everything, you know, helping to augment, especially in our, in our industry, giving a human analyst more time to do analysis and less time to have to do the mundane. Um, intelligent video is a, is a huge technology coming up. In the past, video has been very passive and typically will stream into a VMS where you can look at it later. Uh, with intelligent video, the cameras are gonna be able to tell you something that just happened. So you may have somebody that you fired who you're very worried about coming back to the organization as an active shooter. You can actually set up a, an alert that says if this license plate shows up in the parking lot, send an immediate alert to our security folks and nobody has to watch those cameras. It's, it's, it's a computer watching it and sending that intelligent video alert. Similarly with uh, sensors, you're gonna have sensors that can move almost anywhere. So uh, in, the, in the case of agriculture or sensing fire, you're gonna have these low earth orbit satellites that are gonna allow high speed internet across the entire world. And this is SpaceX and uh, Amazon both doing these, um, putting up high speed internet access points where virtually anywhere you're gonna be able to drive, you know, new types of sensors. And, then, and it becomes a combination capability, right? So you may have a, a robot that's carrying a sensor that's using satellite internet and, and artificially intelligent software and intelligent video cameras to give you situational awareness on emergencies that you're gonna to need to, uh, to know about. So very rapidly changing uh, world from the uh, 40 years ago when I was in the army in Stuttgart uh, watching for somebody to show up across the uh, horizon. So that's the end of our webinar. Uh, from a summary standpoint, you know, I, I just want to underscore economic recovery is going to be very difficult. This is we've never done this before, and there are a huge number of lessons that are going to have to be learned and uh, and encountered by companies. Uh, situation awareness can help you. Uh, so can proactive threat monitoring or give you more time to react to some of the changing things. And certainly acquiring tools are gonna to let you leverage your smart people and save time as you go through this, this difficult recovery process. And so I encourage you to think about these priorities, you know, create and use this command center model that we just talked about. Uh, check out the articles from Deloitte and McKinsey. They're both very well-written articles and give a very good set of rationale to take back to your management as to why do we wanna do this? Why do we wanna centralize things as opposed to just letting it happen uh, you know, across the organization uh, from the bottom up. And then remember the lessons, both good and bad, that you take away from this, uh, this process. Uh, we're certainly gonna need them, need them again, hopefully not soon, but you know, we don't know. You know. We don't know about a second wave of the virus. We don't know about other major global things that can, uh, can affect the, uh, the world. And so trying to become more resilient and be able to incorporate that into your everyday life and planning for your organization is likely to pay some pretty strong uh, benefits. So thanks for attending. And I think we're gonna have some time for some, uh, 
some questions. And uh, that is not my email address, but you can email Julie as well. My email address was on the first uh, the first slide. So Miranda, do we get any questions through the, uh, through the chat function? Thank you so much, Pete. Yeah, we do have um, some questions here. So first up, can we get a copy of the presentation to share with our team back at HQ? Uh, yes, email us and uh, we can make a copy of it available. The uh, The entire webinar will also be up on YouTube over the next, um, you know, 30, 30, 36 hours, 24 hours. So, but certainly. Absolutely. Um, we also have, when do you think the economy will be back to normal? That's a that's a tough question. I, I've actually been doing a weekly brainstorming session with about eight different corporations, people from consulting firms to mass transit to uh, to a uh, council of governments to just a wide variety. And the the estimates vary. And every week, everybody seems to change their estimate. So I, I saw one story this morning that said, you know what, in 12 months everything's going to be good. We're going to have a V-shaped recovery. You know, we're at the bottom of the, the bottom of the V because we've gone almost straight downhill and we're just going to bounce right up and everything's going to be great in a year. I said, you know, three articles later, there's one that says, oh, such and such an economic group thinks it's going to take 10 years for the impacts of this to be, to be fully absorbed into the, uh, the worldwide markets. So, for, for me, I, I would be, you know, somewhere in the middle of that. I, I don't think it's going to happen in a year. I think I think it's going to take a long time, for example, before I'm ready to go do international travel for business. And I think, you know, that's going to be reflected by millions of other people. I think it's going to be a long time, uh, you know, before I go to a sporting event. And I think a lot of other people will be thinking about that when you go with 60,000 of your closest friends, um, that now suddenly it's it's different. Than it was two years ago. You know, two years ago, you know, a football game with sixty thousand people, it's great. You never give it a second thought as to you know catching infectious disease that might kill you. That's a very hard thought to get out of people's heads. So in my mind, it, it's a twenty-four to thirty-six month time horizon um, to to get back to the new normal, and that's going to look you know very different. You know, I think there's going to be new industries that emerge uh, and really become you know amazing. Um, there are going to be other industries like the cruise ship industry. I personally don't have a prayer of them surviving. I mean, I just can't imagine the idea of getting on a cruise ship locked up with uh, 6,000 other people for a week uh, after seeing some of the stories in this one. So diff difficult situations for many, uh, many different businesses. For sure. It's, it's definitely not too early to talk about recovery or too late. Um, we also have... What are surge resources and how do they work? Uh, so I touched on surge resources earlier. It, it's resources that you can use uh, when you've suddenly got to augment your capabilities and you didn't budget for them. So, you know, 25 years ago, you know, if you thought at most you need 10 people, you know, you might budget for 10 people and you might get them. You know, today, it's like, how many do you have to have? And it's like, oh, I have to have five. It's like, but then what happens when I need 10 because we've had a huge uh, upsurge of, of either business or a crisis, those kinds of things. It's those additional people that you can, you can add on to your capability to give you more, you know, more um, horsepower in the event of, of that surge. And so those people can come from inside because maybe you have a plan where you've gone out and you've surveyed your employees and found out that these people have dual sets of skills and they can be taken away from a non-essential function and moved into an essential function, or it may be part of a service level agreement with some of your vendors to be able to provide you know, additional capabilities in terms of people when, uh, when needed. We have another question. Can you integrate into incident management software? Uh, yes. So the, the way TX360 is designed is it has, has a number of, uh, of, of, of interoperable data formats that can be absorbed and also we can, we can send information out. So for example, RSS, GeoRSS, Common Alerting Protocol, which is a, a phenomenal standard that's been adopted worldwide, uh, KML from, a, from a emerging different uh, geographical uh, information systems together. Uh, several of those can be done without any programming whatsoever. 
And then in the event there's something you know very specialized, we have a full uh, application programming interface that can be brought to play to uh, to integrate with other solutions. The next question says, does our command center have to be centralized or can it be distributed? Uh, it can be it can be what you choose. So uh, I think most of the traditional models are you know centralized for very fast and rapid communications. But I think there are people that have also done a distributed model and a virtual model where because they don't want to take the risk of everybody becoming um, you know reinfected with the virus or either spread out over a very large area that it's uh, it's distributed. So our our technology will support whatever way you do it. Um, and it's really probably an individual business decision of what's best for um, what's best for your organization. This next question asks, can your platform TX360 track my 5,000 assets all over the world? Uh, yes. So as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, all of our intelligence feeds and our, our mapping capabilities global. Uh, we've actually had up to uh, 13,000 locations for, for an individual company in our uh, in our system. So we can support a very large number of, uh, of geographic locations around the world. Next asks, do you have a way to code facilities with color coding status? Uh, yes. So that's actually a, a recent uh, addition to our product is the ability to use uh, red, yellow, and green indicators. So for example, if you're a restaurant chain and you have 2000 stores spread out across the country, or we'll just stick with the US for right now, being able to, to have each one of those assets uh, color-coded with information pertaining to their reopening status gives you the ability to very quickly visualize where you need to go from a, uh, from a reopening standpoint. Absolutely. And uh, last but not least, what does TX360 cost? Uh, TX360 is available under a variety of, uh, of price points. Uh, our standard TX360, which, which will take care of a you know, medium-sized company and, and in some cases even a large company, uh, is about $3,300 a, uh, a month on a software as a service basis. You know, no multi-year commitment. You know, you can use it. You can scale it up. You can scale it down, and uh, and uh, again, don't have to have a a long-term contract, and can be deployed within 24 hours if need be. Excellent. Well, that's all of our questions wrapped up. Great. Well, thank you everybody for attending, and if you do have follow-up questions, by all means, uh, email us or call us. And thank you again, everybody. See you at the next webinar.